This video is part of a larger series on full stack data science. In the previous video of this series, I introduced this idea of a full stack data scientist and described the four hats that it involves. In this video, I'm going to dive into the first of these four hats, which is that of a project manager. I'll start by introducing a five step project management framework specifically for data science. And then I'll walk through a concrete example of the project manager's role in implementing this framework. And if you're new here, welcome. I'm Shah. I make videos about data science and entrepreneurship. And if you enjoy this content, please consider subscribing. That's a great no cost way you can support me in all the videos that I make. Before diving into the framework, I think it's helpful to take a step back and ask ourselves, why do we need project management? While there's surely cases where project management feels more like red tape and constraints as opposed to something that pushes a project forward, the way I see just a little bit of planning and structure can go a very long way when it comes to implementing projects that involve a lot of moving pieces. Here are a few reasons for that. First, project management involves all of the planning and scoping for a project. Just like how an architect will draw out a blueprint for a building before it's actually built, project managers will draw out the blueprint of a project before it is implemented. Next, data science projects often involve bringing together multiple pieces. This includes data sets, compute, technologies, and of course, this involves people. These could be individual contributors, they could be your stakeholders, or other people involved in making the project happen. And then finally, project management helps keep projects on time and on budget. So while this video is specifically about data science projects, everything that I said here is not something unique to data science projects. In fact, these three things are going to be relevant to project management in any domain. However, there are some unique considerations for data science projects, which brings up a five-step project management framework that I like to use when approaching a model build or the development of some other data-driven solution. The framework is shown here where it's broken down into five phases, starting from phase zero, which is what I call the problem definition and scoping phase. Phase one is the data acquisition, exploration, and preparation. We can also think of this as all the data engineering work. Next is phase two, which is the solution development. This could be training a model or it could be doing some kind of analytics. This will typically involve a data scientist or maybe even a data analyst. Next, phase three is the solution deployment. So this is actually taking the solution and putting it into the real world so that it can actually have an impact. And then finally, phase four is the evaluation and documentation step. Let's dive into each of these phases phases a bit more deeply. Starting with phase zero, the problem definition and scoping phase. This will involve formulating the business problem. Basically asking ourselves, what problem are we actually trying to solve? Next is designing a solution to that problem. Any given problem will have countless ways it can actually be solved. So it's important to make a decision on the best way one can solve the problem at hand. Finally, defining the project requirements and roadmap. So in other words, what do we need to make this project happen? and what what will the implementation look like? Next we have phase one, which is the data acquisition, exploration, and preparation. So this might involve looking at internal databases, looking to third-party data vendors, or any other data source. Evaluating available data also means asking the question, do we have sufficient information to solve the problem at hand? Another key step of this phase is acquiring and exploring the data. So this includes things like exploratory data analysis, where one is just trying to get a sense of of the information that can be gleaned from the data set. And then finally, the development of data pipelines. So this is your extract, transform, and load pipelines, or your extract, load, and transform pipeline. Next, we have phase two, which is the solution development. So this might be the part most people are excited about, which is the model development. So developing AI and data solutions. But it's not just about training a model or building some other analytic solution. It's also about evaluating that solution in terms of of its validity and the value that it generates. And this evaluation process will often involve iterating with stakeholders. Next, we have phase three, which is solution deployment. So the basic idea here is to integrate the solution into the real world business context, whether that's automating a particular workflow or making information available to stakeholders via a dashboard, maybe updating a widget on a website. So this can take many different forms. Additionally, for some sort of intervention, you know, 
you're updating a new business process, you also may need to implement a solution monitoring pipeline. It's not just about making a change and walking away, but making a change and consistently evaluating the efficacy of that change. And then finally, phase four is the evaluation and documentation step. So this involves assessing project outcomes and comparing them against the expectations from the outset of the project. This is also delivering technical documentation and user guides. And then finally, doing a retrospective, reflecting back on the project, looking at things that went well, looking for opportunities for improvement, considering the future works and the limitations of the current project, and starting to talk about the obvious next steps. And of course, we have these feedback loops in this five-step framework. Some key ones are shown here where you may come to phase one and you might be evaluating the available data and you may find that we thought we could solve this problem, we could build this model with the data we have internally available, but upon further investigation, that's not the case and we'll have to figure something else out. So that'll require going back to phase zero and asking ourselves, okay, how can we get this data? Do we look to a data vendor? Do we try to get it from publicly available sources? Another key feedback loop is between phases two and phase one. So say during model development, there seems to be some kind of bias in the model. And then upon further investigation, you find that a particular exception wasn't properly handled in the transform phase or the data pre-processing step. So that'll require going back to phase one, updating the data preparation pipeline, and then returning back to phase two to train the model. Another feedback loop is from phase two to phase zero. So the data may be properly pre-processed and there's nothing wrong with it, but still upon training the model, the predictive performance may not be as good as the existing solution. So this might require going back to phase zero and reassessing the solution design and asking, is there a better way we can solve this problem? The final feedback loop is if everything goes according to plan, value is generated, but of course no project is ever complete. There are always opportunities for improvement. And then you'd return back to phase zero to start building a broader solution. So while the project manager is ultimately responsible for the successful implementation of the project and ensuring that each of these phases happens, the key contribution of the project manager is this phase zero. Because if this phase zero is not done properly, it's going to cause problems in every subsequent phase of the project. So this brings us to the key role of the project manager, which is this phase zero, the problem definition and scoping. And as we saw in the previous slide, this consists of three key steps. The first is the problem diagnosis. It's often the role of the project manager to collaborate with stakeholders and project owners to get a clear understanding of the problem that they're trying to solve. And it's critical to get this step right. Because if you think about it, if you don't diagnose the problem properly, you can spend a lot of time and effort solving the wrong problem, which no one wants. Wants. The stakeholder doesn't want that and the team doesn't want that. So being able to facilitate these conversations with stakeholders is a key skill of any project manager. While I won't go too deeply into what this might look like, I do have an entire video dedicated to this topic, which I'll link up on the screen here. So once you have a clear idea of what problem you're trying to solve, then comes the task of identifying the best way to solve that problem. So this requires a project manager to bring together a lot of different information. They have to bring together the business context, the priorities of the stakeholder. They have to consider the available technologies, the available resources, the available data, the available budget, the available timeline, and there also might be competing priorities. And beyond that, any given problem will have a wide range of potential solutions and varying degrees of complexity and scope. So at the end of the day, the project manager has to synthesize this information to help the stakeholder or the project owner make the bet of what's the best way to solve the problem. And then finally is the implementation plan. Once the solution has been defined, there's still the matter of the details of what this thing's actually gonna look like and how it's gonna be built. And even still, any given solution can have a wide range of potential implementations. So to make this a bit more concrete, I'm gonna walk through a concrete case study. The point of this is to one, perform the phase zero for this project that I'm building, but the second is to 
walk through step by step what it looks like being a full stack data scientist. And so here, this is me putting on the project manager hat for this project. Starting with a bit of background, I make content on YouTube and write articles on Medium. What this looks like is I'll make content about whatever's interesting to me, whatever I'm curious about, or things that I've personally experienced. Since I am just talking about whatever's interesting to me, it might be difficult for people to navigate all the different pieces of content I make across these two platforms. Which brings up the problem. Potentially, I talk about too many topics across too many platforms. So to kind of give a flavor for this, I'll talk about things from topological data analysis, AI for business, causal inference, how much I made writing on Medium, how to get a data science job, more philosophical things like what it means to be anti-fragile, more personal things like my struggles with anxiety, and now to this series of becoming a full stack data scientist. So someone who's seeing this content for the first time or is trying to navigate this very diverse landscape of content might have trouble finding the content that's most relevant to them. Which brings up the proposed solution, which is a semantic search function for my YouTube videos. What this might look like is a web page where users can type in a natural language query or a question, and then the web page will return search results of YouTube videos relevant to that query. So this only addresses half of the problem I mentioned on the previous slide, which is I make too many topics on too many channels. This only solves that first problem of too many topics. So the hypothesis is if these topics are more easily searchable and they're easier to navigate, then more people will engage with the content and then more people will share the content and that'll promote the growth of the YouTube channel. And so you might be thinking, Shaw, why are you just solving half the problem? Why not solve the whole problem? That brings up this broader question of should I build a POC or a proof of concept? I know there are a lot of different opinions on POCs and some people love them, some people hate them. I personally believe that POCs are very valuable when it comes to building machine learning projects. You can do all sorts of interesting things with machine learning, but of course, of all these interesting things you can do, only a small subset of them actually generate value. So the first reason why I believe in POCs is that they help you validate the idea. I can put together this proof of concept version of the web page. I can make it available to some people in my audience. I can make it available to some people that I know and they can provide me feedback, which will help in making this decision of, is this something worth pursuing or should I just cut my losses and move on to something else? The second reason is often with data science projects, efforts tend to stack on top of each other. So if I properly build this proof of concept for YouTube videos, it should only be a marginal effort to include my medium articles into the same interface. Now that we have a clear picture of what the solution will look like, how do we actually make that happen? That brings us to the implementation plan, the first part of which are the project requirements. So this includes the roles, the data, the compute infrastructure, and the technologies needed to implement the project. Here I list off the roles of the full stack data scientists. So these are the four hats mentioned in the previous video. The first is the project manager, then we have the data engineer, data scientist, and ML engineer. And what's important to note, even if you are a full stack data scientist, maybe you still want to bring in a data engineer or a data scientist to help you build the project. Or maybe you want multiple data engineers, or maybe you want to bring in someone to do the data science and the ML engineering piece while you just do the project manager and data engineering piece. So it's important to note that roles do not equal people. Multiple people can do multiple roles and a single role can be done by multiple people. The next is the data requirements. So here I put an evaluation data set, which will consist of 50 query video pairs that will help evaluate the quality of the search. So in other words, I need a data set I can use to evaluate the performance of the search function that I built. So what that'll look like is a list of 50 queries and an associated YouTube video ID with that query. For infrastructure, I'm gonna use AWS LightSail, which makes it super easy to deploy Docker containers. And then finally, technologies, I included all that I could think of at least at this point. So I'm gonna use Python for basically everything. I'm gonna use the YouTube API to pull in some data. There's a Python library that downloads the automatically generated captions of a YouTube video. I'm gonna use Pandas or Polars to handle the data structures, the sentence transformers library to generate text embeddings, fast API to make an API, Docker to containerize scripts, and then Gradio to spin up a front end. And then finally, I'm gonna put everything in a GitHub 
GitHub repo and have the documentation be part of that repo. Next, we have the project roadmap. So this consists of a few different things. These are the project milestones, which I map to phases one through four of the five-step project management framework discussed earlier. Then we have a task description. So what are the tasks that make up this milestone or this phase? Assigning a role to each task and assigning a due date to each task. You can add more things here, like a more detailed description or acceptance criteria. But I would say that these four elements of milestone, task, role, and due date are the bare minimum you need to make a proper project roadmap. I'll just kind of briefly fly through these. I don't want to spend too much time reading it, but you can always pause the video and read through these if you like. Phase one is all the data engineering stuff. So this is extracting the transcripts and saving them as a parquet file. Phase two will consist of exploring multiple embedding models and testing the search function using the evaluation data set. And then once that's done, creating a video index that is searchable. Phase three will consist of building an API for this search function, containerizing it, testing it locally, building a simple Gradio UI, and then deploying it on AWS. Phase four will consist of creating the documentation and doing a project retrospective. So future videos of this series will walk through each of these steps. And I haven't built this. You're seeing this thing live. You're seeing this thing raw. So I'm sure there's going to be some changes here. Things are going to come up that I didn't expect. And I'm going to have to come back to phase zero. Maybe I fall behind on the due date. Since this is an independent project, I don't have a manager. I don't have a broader team holding me accountable. But committing to these due dates on this video and committing to posting a video every single week on YouTube is helping give me structure to this project and keeping me motivated. So everyone's comments from the previous video saying I'm excited for the next video of this series were actually very helpful to me to sit down and be productive and work on this project. The next video of this series is going to walk through phase one of this project. So everything I described in the previous slide. So at a high level, this will consist of building a data pipeline, more specifically an extract, load, and transform pipeline. So what that'll look like is we'll start by extracting video captions from YouTube using Python. Then we'll load these video captions into a parquet file, and then we'll transform these captions into text embeddings. So this is our data pipeline that I'll discuss in the next video. Since I am using an ELT extract, load, and transform paradigm here, technically this will actually be in phase two. ELT sounds better than EL. So that's why I put it all here. Okay, so that brings us to the end. I hope you got some value out of this video. Like I mentioned in the previous video, this whole series is part of my own personal learning process. So if you have any questions or suggestions on this project, please drop those in the comment section below. Those are very valuable to me. And as always, thank you so much for your time and thanks for watching.